Hey, Don. Yeah. What's the word? Impending. As in, I have this sense of impending happiness. Where'd you hear that? I I heard heard it through the the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collective voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hey, Don. Hey, everybody. I'm Sam, an alcoholic in Palm Springs, California. Sam, I am grateful. Ew. Why Why is that? Don't tell me this is going to be a gratitude meeting. No, no. I wouldn't want to put you through something like that, Sam. <sighs> Good. Having to look at your one precious glowing gem of a life and being grateful for it. I see what you're doing there. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's the first week of November. The new grapevines are here. <laughs> Yay! And there's some inspiring passages from grapevine writers over the years on gratitude pulled from deep in the vast, dank, dark, grapevine vault vault, vault. (laughs) they really need to get some proper lighting and a dehumidifier in there (laughs) (laughs) there are also stories from our brand new book fun and sobriety oh yeah i read that book of course you did so did i we did a podcast on it (laughs) in the story bright lights of fun a member learns to replace her old ideas of fun with joy contentment and authentic belly laughs I like belly laughs. Thanks to a great home group, a newcomer in a big splash discovers how to have a blast tubing on the river without beer. And a sober dad cuts a rug at his daughter's wedding in the sweet tail dancing machine. Give someone a subscription for the holidays. Grapevine and Lavinia are wonderful 12-step tools to help reach alcoholics in detoxes, rehabs, jails, or even writing your own home groups. Go to aagrapevine.org and look for Carry the Message at the very top of the page. Get your groups involved. Every Monday, check out our new Grapevine podcast, a fun half-hour variety hour. Uh, uh, Don, is- Don, the listeners already know about the podcast. This is kind of like those in-person meetings where they say, we meet here every Monday night at 211 Main Street. It's unnecessary. <laughs> Everybody's already here. I've, I've always wondered about that when meetings do that. But <laughs> but wait, and this is from the magazine. And the, there's an ad in the magazine. And it goes on to say that- We don't put ads in that well, magazine. Well, it's not an ad. <laughs> it's oh, a promotion, okay. but it's oh, information okay. about the podcast. <laughs> and it goes on to say- the Grapevine podcast featuring interviews, jokes, and please send us your jokes. We really need your jokes. That's the copy. <laughs> Is that the management ridiculing our jokes? Well, maybe yes, but <laughs> all of these jokes come from the Grapevine, and we need more of them. People, send us your jokes. There are never, never enough that sounds a little alcoholic, Don. Yeah, right. To submit jokes, go to aagrapevine.org and scroll down to share your story or art. Who's our guest today? Don, today's guest is David S., the author of One Breath at a Time. His story is on page 29 of the November 2022 issue. He wrote about step 11, especially about meditation. And I always love to hear exactly how people meditate, how they pray and how they meditate. I mean, exactly how to do it. Because when I came into AA, I I had a lot of rules about prayer and meditation. And all of that really worked against me. Hearing other folks talk about their real experience, that helped me so much. Yeah, hearing folks' real experience is what it's about. Grapevine does not accept donations, but you can offer your support by making a purchase at store.aagrapevine.org or by the Carry the Message gift certificates to sponsor Grapevine subscriptions for alcoholics in need. That's store.aagrapevine.org. Hi, everybody. I'm David. I'm an alcoholic. My home group is Nightlight on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. My sobriety date is February 16th, 1980. Very glad to be here. Thank you. David, thanks so much for joining us. David, what was going on with you when you were drinking and decided for some reason to quit 
and come to Alcoholics Anonymous of all things? Right. Well, I can't say it was my bright idea to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I, uh, I was directed here by a therapist I had been seeing for several years who would periodically encourage me to go to AA. And in fact, I did go in, in 1977 after a very quite awful incident with a gun, which I won't get into, it scared the bejesus out of my girlfriend and my girlfriend's parents at their country home. Okay. Anyway, I got here in the spring of 1977 and I, I lasted maybe a week, I can't remember, but I was gone shortly thereafter and within a month I was drinking again. And it says in our book, over any considerable period, our drinking only gets worse. And that was certainly true for me. The blackouts became more frequent and just the unmanageability was just there. And How long was that period before you came back to AA? It was a year and a half. And the odd thing about it, or maybe the not so odd thing about it, is that I never thought about AA when I went back out. Hmm. It was like a riptide had taken hold of me and was pulling me far from land. Ooh, I identify with that. Yeah, you know, my therapist was frankly my, my lifeline at that point. And as, you know, being an alcoholic sooner or later, I turned on him. I left him a very abusive and ugly message over the Christmas holidays in 1978. I'm going to put a bullet in your brain, you know, and hung up the phone. Hmm. Whereupon he called me. Maybe it was the next day and said, so what was that about? And I said, well, I couldn't get it together to send Christmas cards this year. I was really upset. And he said, don't worry about it. I got your Christmas card. Now go to AA. And then I thought of something else. I thought, well, you know, my typewriter is broken. I needed a new typewriter. Whereupon he said, David, you don't need a new typewriter. You need a new life. Now go mm -hmm. to AA. Were these excuses to not go to AA? They were excuses for my behavior as mm. much as anything. I think that the call was in itself like a, um, a flare from a sinking ship. You know, it was my distress signal. And we didn't know how to ask for help at that point, right? So uh, we, we lash out instead. That's right. But in a way, in, a, in an ugly way, it was telling on myself because now he heard the ugliness of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Not the David who would come to these sessions and be dry and bitch about his boss, but the ranting, crazy alcoholic David with no consideration of anyone's feelings but his own. Was that the first time that your therapist had met the alcoholic David, so to speak? Well, I was introduced to him for a consultation in 1976. I was uh, doing dry goods as well as alcohol, and I had literally lost my mind. I was in the grip of a uh, very... Uh, violent fantasies of stabbing my girlfriend or hurting myself, jumping in front of a subway train. But David, that sounds like you're lucky to be alive. Well, I, I certainly believe that. I was going down. You know, he was a very skillful, insightful person. He held out his hand and he said, give me the pills because I was taking these diet pills in lieu of speed. And, mm -hmm. uh, and drinking huge quantities of alcohol on top of it. And uh, I've been doing that for two years. Give me the pills, he said. And I had them on me and I gave them to him. We'll see what happens with your drinking when you get employed, when you get straightened out with your life, you know. If he had said to me, sign a pledge that you'll never take a drink again, I would have been out the door. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's why I'm a bona fide alcoholic. So by not taking the pills... And then you had to focus on your drinking. Is that what gave you the realization that I'm out of control, I need help? Well, it took close to three years for me to come to that realization. Denial is very powerful, and it took my therapist to uh, direct me here. What could you say to someone who might be struggling at this moment with this very problem? Well, I would say what we generally say in AA, you know, come to an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, sit and listen, have a cup of coffee, nothing is expected of you, and see if you identify in any way with what you're hearing and what you're seeing there. Is that what happened to you? You know, the therapist was great, but he was not an alcoholic, and yet I remained emotionally tied to him for my first year in, in recovery, in quotes. Periodically, I would drink. And I believe the reason I was drinking periodically is that I was at arm's length from the fellowship. 
I would come to the meetings, but I would leave early and all that sort of thing. And mm. I didn't have a sponsor. And, you know, I was kind of auditing Alcoholics Anonymous. There's that old saying, those are the ears to hear, let them hear. I didn't seem to have the ears to hear. I couldn't hear those simple suggestions. I couldn't apply them to myself. Inwardly, I thought I imagined I felt that I was somewhat different, mm-hmm. which is, you know, classic for alcoholics in early recovery. And it wasn't until I picked up my last drink in February 1, 1980, that periodically I would pick up a drink, but it was like a car engine. You put the key in it and the ignition doesn't turn. The engine doesn't start. But when I took that last drink at that work-related party in on February 1, 1980, the engines roared to life. I mean, I felt the full effect of my alcoholism. I was going to bust out loose, I'm going to load up on booze, I was going to go out and see the woman I'd been seeing outside the marriage, resume my old ways. And uh, mercifully, I got home. My wife smelled the alcohol on me and was horrified because she knew what that meant. A day or two later, I was back at the AA meetings where I raised my hand and I said, I'm David and I'm back. The woman leading the meeting, God bless her, said, do you have a sponsor? And I said, no, ma'am. And she said, why don't you get a sponsor? And she was very tart with me. And I walked out of that meeting with no intention of getting a sponsor, but I was intercepted by a woman named Susan, one of my angels, who said, I'll arrange a sponsor for you. Hmm. A couple of days later, a fellow named Jack calls me and um, tells me to meet him at a coffee shop on the east lower east side of Manhattan. Did you resist meeting him or were you ready to go? I was quite reluctant. I mean, if he saw how much I had and how much superior I was to him, he'd give me a hard time. (laughs) And it was like a force field trying to keep me away, but I did go. I sat down with Jack and he was kind of tough. He was uh, very direct. He said, you know, David, you're exhibiting antisocial tendencies. You can't even make eye contact with me. Don't you have any curiosity what it might be like to be without alcohol and drugs after all these years? You know, you have to understand that your unhappiness has nothing to do with AA. It has to do with the fact that you can't stop drinking. He also said, and I don't know that we would say that today, I was on mood elevator medications at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, you have to understand that they loosen your commitment to sobriety. That was, you know, we used to say in AA, there's a wrench for every nut. Mm -hmm. And he was my wrench. And what he said to me was entirely appropriate. I mean, we do have a tense tradition. We do regard medications as an outside issue, and that's rightfully so as entirely between our doctor and ourselves. Mm -hmm. But in my case, I felt the truth of it because the book says, you know, what we need essentially is a capacity to be honest. And I would sit in those meetings and I would feel like a guy with training wheels on his bicycle, that I was kind of cheating. I wasn't really sober. And um, it was the pharmacological buffer but it wasn't the spiritual buffer that I needed. The spiritual buffer came when I surrendered the pills and just surrendered myself to the care of Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, began doing the things that newcomers do, you know, talking with my sponsor about things that I used to drink about, my fears, my insecurities, my resentments, and engaging in service, being becoming the coffee maker at my home group, you know, and getting there an hour early. and That's the way you kept from feeling like an outsider. Exactly. The service integrated me into the life of AA. Prior to that, I'd been sort of aloof and defensive and even hostile. Yeah. Now I was giving something to the meeting. I was opening myself to the fellowship. I want to go back to the outside issues, drugs and alcohol. You know, I had a similar experience. I I went to a therapist, a psychologist, thinking that if I could figure out what was wrong with me, I could then control my drinking. He suggested that that I take some um, mood-altering drugs. He suggested that I take some pills. And I said, well, what about cocaine? Why don't you just prescribe me cocaine? I love cocaine because... (laughs) I had you manipulative this... alcoholic. You. <laughs> well, I knew he wouldn't do it, but I had this sense that uh, 
this is all the stuff that's really not working. It sounds like, David, that you had a sense that the drugs, though given to you for good reason, with good motive, were a part of what was keeping you apart. That's the sense I had. And ultimately, that's the way I got to AA, was finally given up. You know, I'm going to have to quit drinking and go to AA. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I mean, the pills reinforced my belief in oral magic, that somehow I was deficient and I needed something to equalize me with all of you, whether it came in dry or liquid. And I have to say at the same time, though, that you know, I've sponsored men who have serious issues that require medication. Yes. The most I will do is refer them to the AA pamphlet on medication. Mm-hmm. The AA member, I think it's called Medications and Other Drugs, which is a very balanced guide, you know, in terms of people who have benefited from medications and people who have frankly relapsed on top of them. There's good reason to take medication under the guidance of a doctor, and we have no opinion on that. But then again, there are situations, I like what you said about the the right wrench for the nut. He could see that this was a problem with you. And so in your case, it was the right call. Exactly. And I just want to point out how much I appreciate both of you talking about both sides of the medication discussion with an Alcoholics Anonymous, because we don't have an opinion on it, but we still share our experience. And there are multiple types of experience that have happened within our fellowship regarding medications. So David, what was one of the obstacles that AA presented to you? Then once you got on the other side, you saw the beauty of it and the benefit. Well, I think the fourth step was illuminating for me. I mean, when I wrote my fears list, At the top of my fears list was uh, my fear that if I gave myself to this program entirely, that the higher power would take away my ambition Mm. and leave me with nothing. And in truth, you know, I kind of was a self-willed alcoholic the first, (laughs) I'm embarrassed (laughs) to say, for the first 10 years of my recovery, I there are periods of dry drunkenness, you know. Uh, I'm someone who has gone through two marriages and two divorces. I could walk on water in the AA rooms, but I difficult in the home, which is, a, as we say in AA, the last place we bring our recovery. Well, one thing was that I left the door open to my disease, to going through the fourth and fifth step, by not focusing enough on the resentment aspect of, of the inventory. I wasn't thorough enough with that. I think it cost me. Um, Well, it's hard, though, the first time you go through it. In my experience, I had to make the list of those that I could see and were willing to look at. And then once I took care and went through the whole process with that, found out the exact nature of the wrong and made amends, gave it to God, then I could look at deeper ones that, that I was like unwilling to before or unable to see. Well, that first fourth step, though it absolutely counts, is also a training on how to do a fourth step so that we can do it again. <laughs> right. It's true. You know, it says in our book, when we you know, going through the fifth step, we may have had spiritual beliefs, but we begin to have a spiritual experience. How did a spiritual experience come out of making an inventory and sharing it with another person, the fourth and fifth step? I kind of feel it began way before that, really. Coming to these meetings and just hearing all of you share from your own point of view, your experience with God or the higher power, just sharing openly and honestly what your beliefs or unbeliefs were, that kind of opened my mind. I came from a very religious background, and I left the church at age 13. I've never gone back. I have to say, although many people do in AA. But when I was a couple of months sober, I did feel from within a presence that kind of shocked me, to be honest. It was just a quiet voice. I have no idea what it said, but it was transformative. This Friday step meeting I attended regularly, and I thought, oh my God, I can talk about God in public. I've been moved over the God line. Yes. (laughs) What is this? But the thing was that it was personal to me in that meeting, in that moment. 
personal to me. It was my own conception. It wasn't something that was forced on me by organized religion or... Right, it was a real experience that you had. There's a vast difference between a belief and an experience, I believe. Yes. Poignantly for me, there was a wines and liquor store, supermarket, across the street from the meeting place, which you could see from the window. And I realized I would never have to go there again. Mm long as I stayed close to all of you. That's a big change. When my feelings about alcohol change from I can't do that to I don't ever have to do that again. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. So now you've got over 40 years of sobriety. In the article that's published in the November 2022 issue of The Grapevine, you talk about your meditation experience, your 11th step experience. Can you share a little bit about what that's like? I was introduced to meditation when I was about a year and a half or so sober. I was pretty diligent in going through the steps. I was well through my ninth step. But I came home one night. I felt hopeless suddenly. I felt like I had hit a ceiling with AA, that there was no more room for growth. And I don't know, like the walls were closing in on me. And then I called my sponsor, Cubby. And he said, it's time for the 11th step. And he directed me to sit in a chair with my spine straight. So there was no fancy lotus position or any of that. And to focus on my breath with my eyes closed for five minutes, my hands gently touching. And um, it was in those five minutes that I, I seemed to have discovered what we mean when we say that AA is an inside job and life is an inside job because all that discomfort fell away and a new peace came to me. I had been praying all along, but for me, I found that my spiritual life was incomplete without meditation. What about your mind wandering? Oh, well, of course, the mind is a monkey cage and all that. And <laughs> we know that. And yet, you know, that's okay. We get to observe that. The idea, I think, is that we gain some distance from it's like we're sitting in a movie theater and watching our mind projected onto a screen. Yeah. And we have some measure of detachment from that. That's what I like about it. The fact that my mind wanders when I first started doing it, and until recently, really, has been, well, I'm not doing it right. And then to discover that actually that's what the practice is, is to watch my mind, and I don't have to engage in all my thinking. It's just my thinking. Exactly. Mm -hmm. David, have you meditated today? I did, yes. Can you describe what that routine is like for you? It's very simple. I mean, I'm not, I'm a novice at this. I, I, I don't pretend to be any kind of, what can I say? I just, I think that the best feature of my smartphone is my timer, you know? <laughs> and it's, yeah. And I, I set it for 20 minutes. I sit in a chair as I did that first night with my eyes closed and hands touching and focus on my breath, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. And that's what I do for 20 minutes. It says at the end of the third chapter more about alcoholism, there will come a time when we have no effective mental defense against the first drink. So I do think it increases our vigilance, meditation and prayer in combination. It fortifies that spiritual defense. But fundamentally, it improves our chances of staying sober, I believe. Well, that's the point. David, is there anything you haven't shared with us that you'd like to share with us? Well, the pandemic was kind of interesting. <laughs> is that an <laughs> statement? It's not quite the right way to put it, is it? <laughs> it was horrific. Yeah. But it gave us the virtual meetings, and that was a blessing. You know, I didn't have to sit home alone with my grapevines and nothing more. And I now had all of you on the screen. But I do think that it, uh, in some way, it can not, not necessarily be dangerous, but that it's called a virtual meeting for a reason. It's an approximation of a meeting. It was very important for me to, to go back to the in-person meetings when the pandemic eased, at least in the Northeast region where I am, mm -hmm. and be there among the fellowship. I was at a, at a virtual meeting yesterday, and the chat was disabled. Well, if the chat is disabled for the entire meeting, how on earth 
are you supposed to extend yourself to the alcohol of the still self? Mm -hmm. It's like being in lockdown. I think for real 12 step work to take place, the chat has to be open for at least at some point, maybe only toward the end of the meeting. People abuse the chat sometimes. Uh, that's the reason that they do it. But I completely agree with you, though. <laughs> yeah, it's also difficult to connect with a person when you're speaking to this group of yeah. people. Exactly. Yeah, so. You know, my home group just recently decided to drop the virtual meetings. We had people say that actually it's gotten to the place where I'm using it as a crutch. I'm just like, oh, I don't really need to drive over there. I'll just sit here. And that way I can go ahead and eat at the same time. Although yeah. there's a really good place for virtual meetings. I mean, I'm 75 now and I'm mobile, but there are those who can't get to meetings. Right. I don't want to sound like I'm dissing the virtual meetings. They're here to stay. They have a place in our AA life. <laughs> so it's... Uh, what are you, what are you saying? I'm... I'm, I'm I'm chuckling because I'm now relating this conversation about online meetings to our earlier conversation about medications, mm. because it is entirely possible for me to use an online meeting in a way that is really helpful and beneficial to my recovery. And there's really good way for me to abuse an online meeting by hiding and detaching from the fellowship and everything by just doing an online meeting. Yeah, absolutely. David, this has been a great discussion. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Grapevine is looking for your story submissions for Why I Love the 12 and 12. Stories are due by December 15th, 2022. Our 12 Steps and 12 Traditions book turns 70 next year. Tell us the ways this book has enriched your sobriety. Is there a story about using the book that you'd like to tell? How does your group use it? What are your favorite passages and why? Share your story by December 15, 2022 via aagrapevine.org slash share. <laughs> you don't have to worry about a will, pal. Rabies can be treated. Will? What will? I'm going to make a list of all the people I'm going to bite. They deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine, Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find AA Grapevine on Instagram and the AA Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit aa.org.